The Kinevin, even though it's spelled Cinevin, it's a Scottish word. Uh, Dave Snowden came up with this one about seven, eight years after Stacy did his picture. Uh, I sort of like this one uh, because it, it really helps people understand. You've got simple, you're, you're sort of going counterclockwise here. You've got simple, complicated, complex, and chaos. Okay. And uh, management consultants, their bread and butter is creating best practice or good practice, but primarily best practice. When you listen to management consultants and even executives and leaders, everybody wants best practice. They want it to be simple. They want it to be simplified. And the reality is, is that for each of these, as you look at them, good practice for complicated, emergent practice for complex, and novel practice for chaos, all of a sudden it makes total sense that for these three boxes for complicated, complex, and chaos that you're going to uh, basically want to use Agile and Agile methodologies. And he has disorder there in the middle. Uh, I've never heard a good explanation yet why disorder is there. I'm sure that there's probably one. And in his mind, I'm sure there's a distinction between chaos and disorder. Uh, by the way, uh, a little humor here. Uh, if you think about it, consultants were the very first profession of any. Because it, if you uh, follow the Judeo-Christian work ethic or the Judeo-Christian uh, traditions and you look at the creation story, it, it talks about the spirit of the living God uh, hovering over the waters and that there was chaos. <laughs> well, uh, the joke is basically, yeah, and who created the chaos? Well, that's us, the management consultants. <laughs> so uh, so we're the, we're the first profession, actually. The one thing I really like about this diagram is you'll notice a little gray band there between chaos and simple. And I really like this because it's sort of like a cliff. And to me, what's amazing in many organizations is that organizations can quickly fall off the cliff from simple straight into chaos. And so this is a really good picture showing that. Now, applying what we did two slides ago to what we just, uh, to what we did to the Stacy diagram, again, if the requirements and technology are known, simple. But if the communications are complex, you're going to use agile. And again, the goal here is to move counterclockwise and take things from the complex and bring it down to the simple. And so it works the same way pretty much on the Kinevin picture as it does on the Stacy diagram. But there's one more thing. I like about this uh, picture, and I sort of alluded to it in one of the previous slides about the management consultants live down here in the simple corner, or even the good practice corner. And since we're management consultants, we also help create chaos. Um, <clears throat> I have an, another picture that shows sort of where these two groups live. And so this is probably one of the key differences between people who are agile purists and people who are management consultants. Agile purists will view all management as evil. And yet they use pictures that come from management consulting in order to try to explain what they do. But what I realized looking at this picture, and, and it actually works, I guess we could turn it and do it the same way on the Stacy diagram, but it worked especially well here, is because the agilists primarily work with chaos, com complexity, and complicated things and use agile to um, distill it down to either emerging practice or good practice or whatever. The management consultants, on the other hand, 
they're dealing, their bread and butter, like I said earlier, is best practice. They own that corner. And that corner lives in the C-suite. The other three boxes, the, the executives delegate that out. And they say, okay, you guys come up with the solution. Okay. And so for the Agile purists, this is an either-or situation. For me, I look at this and I go, no, it's a both-and situation to really deliver the value that a customer and client needs you need to know when to wear your agile hat and you need to know when to wear your management consulting hat. I know that this was a little bit of a segue away from vision momentarily but I wanted to especially go through the Stacy diagram because that's gonna bring us back into uh, how we look at anticipatory vision. So basically what I did is take the ideas from Flash Foresight and the ideas from the anticipatory, anticipatory organization and created a Stacy-like diagram for anticipatory vision. And so on the left, we have high clarity of vision, low, low clarity of vision, low ability to execute strategy versus high ability to execute strategy. And as organizations are being disrupted, as they are uh, watching what competitors are doing, and then they're saying, oh, we need to be agile so that we can uh, react to what the changes that just happened in the marketplace are. And so if we react to those changes, that means that we're living down in the reactive corner, which means we're being driven by circumstance. <coughs> and reactive and proactive have been around in business literature since the 80s. This isn't really a new concept in that sense. The two ideas that Dr. Pur Burris introduced are, in his book Flash Foresight, the ability to be preactive, being able to perceive what may be going to happen. So it takes proactive and takes it to the next level that Dr. Burris described as preactive. <clears throat> if you're starting to live in a preactive state as a company, you're already going to be light years ahead of your competition because now you're no longer going to just react or be proactive. You're actually going to be the pace setter and the leader, and you're not going to be the trailer or somebody who's just led by what's happening in the marketplace. Anticipatory is being able to take the hard and soft trends and go one step beyond just being preactive and being able to predict what is going to happen in the future. And so that's basically what we're, what we're going through on this slide is we've combined the concepts of flash foresight with reactive, proactive, preactive with the concept of being anticipatory, being able to predict off the hard trends and soft trends. Now, our view is, is that <clears throat> without flow, that is having a well-defined agreed to vision and having high clarity of that, plus the ability to execute the strategies on which, from which you've distilled those from your vision, you're not going to be able to deliver an anticipatory organization. I've probably shared the picture before 
Um, but I think I'm, I'm actually going to uh, draw a picture now and just drop it in these, uh, this slide deck as part of what anticipatory vision actually looks like and how it works. As I shared in the transformation video that I've done earlier, uh, I have a really good example of anticipatory vision where the soft trends, the hard trends, uh, your gut instinct, uh, your ability to see beyond the horizon, not just to be reactive, proactive, or preactive, but truly step into that zone of anticipatory vision. I was working with the guys from Nokia many, many years ago, and uh, some of the executives, we were working on a different project together that wasn't directly tied to Nokia, but <clears throat> they uh, were interested about my thoughts about, hey, what's all this with the uh, Apple iPhone? What is it that really is going to, you know, why should we consider this a threat? Well, what do you think, Andrew? What, what's, what's really going on with the iPhone? And I looked at them and I said, well, you know, uh, in, in a brilliant flash of, of anticipatory vision, I walked up to the whiteboard and I, threw, I drew these three lines with a 1, a 10, and a 100. And I said, well, guys, I said, it's going to go like this. And they looked at me and they said, well, well, what's this mean? I said, well, you know, this first iPhone will probably sell a million units. And they're shaking the cobwebs out of the system. The second version of the iPhone will probably sell some 10 million units. When they get to the third version of the iPhone, they're going to sell 100 million units, minimum. And I remember one of the leaders leaning forward to me and just laughing, oh, Andrew, that's never going to happen. We produce 462 million handsets a year. We have a brand that is right up there with Coca-Cola and Nike, and, and we, we have worldwide recognition for what we're doing. Besides the 462 million handsets that we produce every year, we own the markets in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Europe the Pacific. We really don't care what the guys in California are doing. And Andrew, come on. They don't even have an alarm clock in their phone. Now, in retrospect, what they had missed was that Apple was implementing a strategy where they were going to create an app store where Apple wasn't going to invest in hiring hundreds or thousands of programmers to develop apps for them as employees. Apple's strategy and vision was brilliant. They instead said, hey, let's create an ecosystem where you've got millions of programmers writing code for applications in the hopes that they'll be able to sell those applications in the app store and become millionaires themselves in the process as they sell a million alarm clocks to people who want to have an alarm clock. Well, a couple years later, Marco, the marketing guy, sends me an email and he goes, and it was just a short email. Andrew, do you remember what you drew on the whiteboard two years ago? You were right. Send a note back to Marku. Marku, what does it matter? Nobody listened. Not even me. 
And, you know, it's like, nobody listened. So Marco sends another note back. He says, well, can I forward this to you, Irma? I said, well, feel free. Never heard from them again. But this, and, and I wish I had taken my own advice. I should have been, when, when I drew this curve, I should have just bought all the Apple stock I could have laid my hands on. And I would be recording this from probably the Bahamas or the Caribbean, uh, not from the Arctic Circle. <laughs> and so um, it's, uh, uh, it would have been wise for me to follow my own advice. But at that time, I, I didn't really like Apple. I was still pretty much pro Nokia. So. And, I, and I told those guys, I said, look, you make the big bucks. Obviously, you know something I don't know. But what's really interesting about this is that in the back of their minds, this echoed in the back of their minds. So that two years later, when Apple sold a million iPhones in the first week, they went, oh, he was right. Well, it doesn't help to be right if nobody listens and nobody acts. What's really sad I mean, really, really sad, beyond belief, is Nokia had a ready-to-go, ready-for-production prototype of a touchscreen telephone with a glass screen. And it, it was a little, uh, roughly the size of an iPhone 5, a little bit wider, a little bit thicker, but it was ready to go. Years years ahead of Apple. But these same executives that laughed at me and said, oh, well, this will never happen. Those same executives made the decision that, no, this is, this is too risky. We're not going to do it. Uh, so they killed the project. And this is the same guys who took Apple from being, or not Apple, they took Nokia from being a manufacturer of rubber tires for cars and rubber boots for people working out in the fields to switching to electronics, making cell phones. <laughs> 